Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at modern and classic American SAM systems. Now, the interesting thing here is the differences between, you know, kind of the east side of SAMs versus the west side of SAMs is fairly significant. Though you will see some similar systems and be like, oh, that's just the American version of the SA9. You will also see a lot of different variety in systems that probably will surprise you. All right, let's go ahead and start with kind of our classic system. So the first system I always think of when I think of the United States SAMs is that goes all the way back to the mid 40s to the late 40s, and that is the CIM 10A Bowmark. Now uh, this is a super unique SAM system in that it was basically designed to be a drone that would basically suicide into a bomber formation. This is also the only SAM system in the history of the United States that was designed and developed and run completely by the United States Air Force. The way this thing worked, by the way, which is super duper clever, is basically you had two ramjet, yes, ramjet engines in the early 1950s mounted to the bottom of this little drone. Now the warhead here, of course, could be a classic warhead or it could of course, be a nuclear warhead. Again, yeah, remember this is the 50s. And what they would actually do is launch this thing and basically inertially guide it until it got to a turn on point and it actually flip on an active radar. It was actually a pulse Doppler radar at the time, which would give it the ability to basically home in on targets on its own. Now, what makes this system super duper fascinating is this is basically a suicide drone. Another way to think about it is it's basically an airborne torpedo. You basically shot it where you hoped the target would be and it would flip its own radar on when it would get there and it would actually start doing its own job once it got within 10 nautical miles. Now, as far as efficiency goes, eh, not great, but it did have one neat trick. It has a staggering range of 240 nautical miles, making it the longest range SAM system in the command universe, with the exception of some of the uh, S-400 techniques that use the ultra long range lofts. This thing's basically, like I said, a mini airplane. So let's go ahead and see what it can do. So first things first, I've gone ahead and done the same thing I did in my last scenario. I'm going to go ahead and create some drones here. I'm going to go ahead and turn everything on. Keep in mind, back in the old days, this is the Cold War database. We don't quite have the same level of sophistication as far as detection goes. Ah, there we are. We've spotted a target. Lock on. Um, I'll be pretty polite here. Well, we'll launch one of each versions of these. Again, this battery is gigantic, and each one of those weapons was basically run on its own. There's another bogey. I'll go ahead and fire a couple missiles at that one, too. And we'll go ahead and let things take over. Now, the Bowmark itself has no internal radar. There's no fire control radar. There's nothing. What the launcher is actually doing is he's firing these things at a point in the sky to which once they hit that point, they're actually going to turn themselves on. There's no mid-course corrections. There's nothing like that with this particular system. Basically, you just lobbed it in the direction you're hoping you're going to get somebody. And when it got close, as you'll see in a moment, it'll actually flip on its own radar and attempt to track a target that it detects. Obviously, given that this is 1950s technology, you can imagine how just not terribly reliable this is probably going to be here. All right, let's see what we got here. It looks like uh, we're going to zip right by. Oh, we got one. Hey, I swear that is the first time I've ever shot somebody down with two bow marks. Now, you'll probably notice there's another guy down here. He's uh, chilling down this one. His altitude is 197 feet. Now, if I grab my bow mark and try to lock onto this guy, I cannot engage him because it's a 1,500 foot limitation. So unfortunately for us, this particular bogey is just gonna be kind of hanging out there and we're not gonna be able to do much about it. As a matter of fact, you can see it's a low altitude F-104. We're never gonna hit that. And I don't have a range officer today. So that was the bow mark. Again, it was the only American system that was run by the Air Force. And it was one of the first long range SAMs. A little later on, of course, uh, you know, the Army said, hey, we wanna do our own thing here. And they developed something called the Nike. Now the Nike is a slick system because it's another vertical long launch system. And unfortunately, this picture does not do justice by how complicated the radar system was on it. There's actually a really neat YouTube video that you can probably track down that actually shows one of these things getting in position. And since they didn't have a television display to track range and position, they actually had a plotter that would draw with a little line that would tell you where the target versus the missile was on a piece of paper. I'm talking a little old school here, but it's actually a pretty neat system. So let's go ahead and uh, get ourselves some more victims here. And again, these things were designed to be gap fillers. These were not designed to be, you know, I'm going to use this for everything. Another thing that makes the SAM, the Ajax, super duper unique, other than having so many, is the crazy number of radars it uses. You know, if you jam one of these, good for you. If you can jam all five, now I'm just impressed. The problem with the Ajax system, though, is it had relatively limited range. You can see we got about 30 nautical mile, which is the equivalent to some of the later versions of the SA-2. I'll go ahead and lock that one up. I'll go ahead and give him three as well. Now, these early systems had the same limitations we're all very familiar with. 
Uh, basically, you couldn't launch against high targets, you couldn't launch low targets, you could not attack fast targets. So I've got this one right here. He's cruising in at uh, 650 knots. My Ajax is uh, locking on to him, and I'm unable to engage because he's too low. Again, this is before the days of pulse Doppler radar. On the flip side, this target, which happens to be a bear A, which uh, blows my mind just a teeny tiny bit because like, when is the last time you've ever seen a bear A? It's just one of those things that was the original bomber bear. But anyway, we're going to go fire Ajaxes up at it. First thing the bomber does is he's going to try to beam him. Remember, these are the old days of radars. So he's going to go like that, and the Ajaxes are all going to swing by him and do absolutely squat. Now, if I wanted to have some fun, I could fire one of these Bowmarks at him. But unfortunately, I don't think the Bowmark's going to work so well here because that's going to be basically a snapshot. Yep, it's getting its inertia. It's mid-course upgrades from Sage there. It's going to turn on its active radar, and it's desperately going to try to track down the two. Oh, got him. That is the most Bowmark kills I think I've ever gotten in the history of me playing this game. That is crazy. Anyway, we'll go ahead and get rid of that drone. So a little bit of time passed. Uh, they said, you know, that that bow mark's pretty slick, especially with a nuclear weapon mounted to the front of it. And the Ajax, eh, it's kind of limited. What can you do for us? Enter the Nike Hercules. Now, the Nike Hercules, um, when you want to talk about a lot of SAM sites in the United States, this was the system that was everywhere in the 50s and 60s. You can get kind of a good look. This is basically a giant concrete shed, and they just sort of lift up and boop, and off they go kind of a thing. You can also see the radars. Like, remember, there's like 10 radars on this thing. It's five by now. So basically, the Hercules is a much, much more improved weapon over the Ajax. And I will go ahead and get some more victims here. Notice we've been completely incapable of engaging our low-altitude targets thus far. We just can't do anything about them yet. So I'm going to grab my Hercules. Notice my range of my Hercules is a staggering 80 nautical miles. 80 nautical miles in the early 60s is uh, pretty substantial. Go ahead and lock onto this guy as well. Also notice most of these systems have the ability to guide more than one weapon at a time, whereas the Soviets preferred to use what they call command guidance, where you tell the missile where to go. Americans preferred using semi-active guidance, where it gave them the ability to point the radar where they wanted the attack to be gone. Now notice we had no problem slapping that target out of the sky. Again, the Nike Hercules were being used in Korea up until just a few years ago. So even though it's an ancient system, it actually saw a lot of use, very similar to our SA-2 buddy. Notice, however, we cannot engage that target because it's still too darn low. All right, let's get that out of here. So now we have one more classic system before we look at some of the modern systems, and that is the safeguard system. Now, I'm just going to say full disclosure here, this is not a complete system. Uh, basically, what you had is you had something called a Spartan missile, which was gigantic. It was basically the Nike Hercules X, if you want to look it up, which has a staggering 460 nautical mile range. And then you had the LIM-99 Sprint. This was a little tiny weapon with a stupidly short range. However, it had one slick trick. Its ability to accelerate was staggering. It went up to 100 gravities. So basically, the idea was with the uh, Spartan missile was to go ahead and engage the missile up in the upper part of the atmosphere. And the sprint was, oh my god, we're about to get murdered, lower altitude, lower atmosphere. Now, this particular one is an anti-ballistic missile system, but um, like I said, it's still under development, so we can't watch it in action. If you want to see an amazing thing, go on YouTube, type in Sprint Missile Launch, and watch how fast that thing travels. Again, 60s and 70s technology here. All right, let's go ahead and fast forward to the present. All right, now we're cooking with gas. So this is a, a modern database, and we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the later developments. So if you remember, the Soviets like to use SAMs basically as denial. They like to use them basically almost in place of interceptor aircraft. Uh, the United States preferred interceptor aircraft, and all of the aircraft were either purpose-built interceptors or they were very, very multifunctional, tremendously expensive platforms. So as far as SAM development goes, it didn't go crazy until very recently. The first SAM-SAM that I always think of that was kind of modern was known as the Hawk missile. This is actually a P-1. This is kind of a modern version. The Hawk is kind of a unique system. It's not the world's biggest missile. Kind of reminds me of an SA-6, if you ask me. I'm glad I'm not standing next to that guy because that'd be very uncomfortable. But basically, you had this small little system. It was pretty poor. You needed a couple trailers. You could just sort of set it up. It had the ability to track three missiles onto one target at a time. It had this little motor on it. Um, and surprisingly high speed interception time. The system, even though it was developed in the late early late 60s, early 70s, it was surprisingly good at intercepting things, even like cruise missiles. So let's go ahead and uh, get ourselves some challenges here. Go ahead and pop them up. You can see we've uh, generated a couple of targets. Go ahead and unpause. And this particular platform, just like the Nike that came before it, has a ton of radars. It's not just a single radar like you saw before. You know, if I come over here at the sensors window, you can see it's actually a collection of radars, which makes it very difficult to jam every single one of them. And that was very unique to the system at the time. All right, so I've gone ahead and got myself uh, two targets here. Go ahead and select both of them. We're going to go ahead and fire two at that one. 
And we're going to fine tune at that one. Of course, we're launching out our handy dandy QF16 again. Apparently, I've got a lot of these things sitting around, so I've got no problem just wasting them. So if you remember our 50s and 60s SAMs, not terribly good at this process. But now that we have this modern platform, let's see what happens here. So we've already get into range. This particular guy is cruising at 890 knots at 33,000 feet. It's already got a hawk coming up to say hello. Now the cruise speed on this thing is two and a half, which is actually extremely fast for its size. Again, it was trading speed for, boop, speed for range. Okay, now we've got this other guy here. This is a bogey number two. Stupid low altitude. Our hawk is pointing straight at him. Ready to fire at a moment's notice. Come on, come on, let's get it, let's get it. Let's find out what happens. Nothing. That's because the hawk was limited, like everybody in the early days, to not being able to engage low altitude targets. That's a known issue. But watch this. Did you notice how we fired a missile anyway when we got to that minimum range? It's because this guy had to pop up to get over this little sandbar, and the moment he did, he entered into the hawk's range, and of course he responded by firing a missile as fast as he could. The problem is, as you can see, oh, we got two more. Boom, boom, ah, we got him, nice. He flew up a little bit over this mountain here too and got nailed. So you can see that the system was okay, but it was pretty good, and there's actually some modern versions of the hawk that are still very, very lethal. So after that, of course, uh, when you think of American SAM systems, uh, most people think of the Patriot. Now, the Patriots actually had an enormous amount of evolution over time. In the old days, you basically had these gigantic missiles parked inside this thing with a staggering range and a stupidly high speed travel rate. And when I say fast, I mean it was like Mach 5 or 6. Like once it was launched at you, that was game. It was also a computer-controlled system. It was designed for anti-ballistic missiles, and it has this really weird radar. And you're probably saying, what do you mean by weird radar? Let me show you. So when I turn that radar on, you could observe that it only points in one direction. All of the SAM systems that we've seen so far have the ability to shoot in 360 degrees. The Patriot can only engage in the direction that its primary fire control radar is pointing. The other thing to notice about a Patriot is it doesn't have a dedicated search radar. It only has its combination fire control radar, which, don't get me wrong, it's an insanely good system, but it's not perfect in that sort of regard. So I'm going to flip the thing back on for a second here. We'll go ahead and get ourselves some more drones. And notice we've already identified a target. He's a pretty good long distance away. And yeah, we'll give him a pair because I think that's fine. Again, the Patriot is kind of a catch-all American super-duper system. I mean, it does it quite a bit. I kind of think of it as the um, American version of the S-300, except for that limitation that it can only fire in one direction. Later versions of this are extremely lethal and also have the ability to lob missiles, which give you an even staggeringly longer range. Another huge thing about the Patriot, unlike everything we've seen so far, is it has the capability to actually launch at multiple targets with multiple missiles at a time. And it actually has a really, really clever little mission computer that has the ability to kind of predict where everything is going to be and launch the missile when it's the best time to launch. It's unique to that particular system. Now notice our guy going at low altitude here, our Patriot's uh, completely incapable of engaging again. The reason for this, of course, is uh, there's no line of sight. As soon as he crossed the little horizon line, uh, he's now got two of these nasty MIM 104Ds coming right at him doing, uh, let's see, Mach 2.2 at low altitude. Ooh, he's done. The Patriot is a really good system, except for the stupid limitation. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our next. So, of course, uh, we go back in time a little bit. Uh, we have the man pads, and somebody came up with a great idea. Is, hey, we'll give infantry a little, little portable you know, surface-to-air missile. Uh, enter the Red Eye. This is uh, one of the early ones. If you want to think of the Soviet equivalent, you're thinking the SA-7. That would be the Grail, is the NATO, or I always like to say the Strela, which is just the arrow. Go ahead and launch ourselves some handy-dandy drones at this one. This early system was uh, kind of garbage. Uh, the big thing about it was it had no range whatsoever, and the warhead on this thing was teeny, teeny, tiny, although it was a very, very clever warhead because of the way it was built, and unfortunately, it was a tail-chasing weapon. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, set ourselves up. I see somebody coming in right now. Go ahead and lock onto him. We'll fire a couple of those at him. Yeah, we got another one sneaking up on us. We'll fire a couple at him too. So as usual with all of these weapons, uh, you'll notice that we have a serious limitation as far as altitudes that we can safely engage at. You can see our little guy up here at 32,000 feet. It's going to sail right over the top of the man pad, and it's not going to do anything. How you doing? Got to go. Meanwhile, our, our aircraft flying considerably lower. I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit so you all can see. You can see he's going to travel right up to the man pad. The red eye is going, ah, oh, do something. And of course, he's not getting a lock, not getting a lock. Can't do anything about it until he turns away from him. Now, the missile crew here is uh, sitting here panicking, trying to get a lock on the uh, tailpipe of this guy, but he's awfully low altitude, and I don't think we're actually going to get a shot off. Nope, the airspeed is too high. So even though we had plenty of time to engage, we couldn't even get a missile off because the airspeed was so high, the missile could not possibly engage him. So again, knowing that limitation makes it much simpler to defeat. A couple years later, of course, uh, we got the Stinger missile, which um, some folks are probably familiar with. Stinger, of course, the early version was 
unbelievably good in Afghanistan. Of course, uh, with a little bit of time, that uh, you know, that, that advantage kind of went away. But you can imagine that in the early days, this thing was just like cheating. And the other thing is they were very portable, they're very easy to use, and they were intelligently designed with a shelf life because they have a little battery on board and this little nitrogen canister to cool off the head of it. This particular system has the ability to shoot people in the front, the back, high speed, low speed, everything along those lines. And you can see our high altitude target completely unmolested as it cruises by. Our low altitude target on the flip side is going to go ahead and re-enter directly into that death range. Our stinger crew is sitting there and look at that, stinger away. Now the warhead on this thing is tiny. It's like one kilogram, but it's more than enough to take your leg off. So keep that in mind as well. So our little handy dandy QF-16 out, we're gonna fire another one. This is one of those times where I'd say, I'll oh, fire everything. I'm just gonna do one of these. <laughs> fire, <laughs> that did it. Now notice the minimum range of that was very, very short. So this is a really, really solid. This is one of the best. It's very like the equivalent to the SA-14 or the SA-17. Okay, so let's bring ourselves over to the Avenger. So the Stinger was not a bad system. It actually worked pretty good at actually engaging targets, especially helicopters, like I said, in Afghanistan. But um, we needed a more portable version because it's kind of lame that you have to kind of hold this thing on your shoulder and it is not exactly lightweight. So enter the Avenger. Somebody realized, hey, we can work with this. So they took basically a Bradley APC and slapped four of these things on the side of it. So it's actually the equivalent of the other system, although you get the advantage that now that you have this is all kind of pre-built and pre-set, you can actually drive around with it. So you've made a mobile SAM. Now, notice the general trend here is the fact that we don't have a lot of mobility in any of our SAM systems. It was just a different philosophy. All right, I see my handy in a QF-16 here. I'll go ahead and fire a four right there because I'm sure I'm going to need more than that. Remember, you're representing a battery of these Avengers. You're not representing a single one. Otherwise, you can only get four total. All right, there we go. Go ahead and speed up. It is actually the identical missile of the Stinger. There's nothing better about it. So, all right, here we go. Here comes our little handy dandy guy. He's going to cruise over the top. Nothing happens because remember, he's high altitude. And he's gone. And here comes our buddy here. He's coming in at low altitude. Our Avenger, remember, can see a little bit further than a person. So he's going to go ahead and start popping those off. He's also got a little machine gun that he can use if he absolutely needs to use it. I don't actually recommend that, but hey, he can get lucky. Notice it can work on front shooting vehicles. Oh, geez, I've got a... <laughs> A bit of a collection up here. I'm gonna go ahead and clean that out because we don't need those guys anymore. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to some of the weird ones. Again, like I said, in the United States was just such a different philosophy as far as design for these things goes. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one right here. Enter the Chaparral. Uh, I probably pronounce that terribly. Um, it's actually interesting because the picture that you see in the background is actually very similar to uh, what they're actually describing here. What this was was an armored chassis. Let me go ahead and show you a picture of this thing that had a little missile launcher. Which you know what missile they used? they used the uh, Sidewinder missile mounted to the top of it. So that gives them the unique ability to go ahead and engage targets as long as you can hit it with a Sidewinder, which is a little weird. It basically gives you, it's an SA-9 or an SA-13 equivalent if you want to think about it another way. So I'm going to go ahead and again, anything you can shoot down with a Sidewinder, you can use against this. I'll target those, go ahead and target those, three each. The same fundamental problems are going to be existing here as they did in the previous one. And that's the fact that because it is a infrared system, you're never going to be able to hit something that's up there high. Meanwhile, this guy is traveling a little bit lower, is going to come right up in front of this thing, and they're going to sit there going, oh, I can't shoot, I can't shoot. You're probably going, why can't they shoot? If you take a look, you'll notice the fact that it's a rear aspect weapon again. So this version, unfortunately, you had to shoot at the guy who already went by you. But that being said, they're still Sidewinder missiles, so they're pretty darn good. Okay, there's one I'm missing in here, and I want to make sure I get that one included. I was just looking there. Hum, ram. There it is. Boop. There we go. I almost forgot this one. So this was a pretty slick system. Again, you know, Sidewinder missile, they're pretty lethal if they catch you. So somebody said, well, can you do the same technology with an AMRAM? And someone said, yeah, let's put it on a Hummer. Enter the Humram. This is a Hummer that fires AMRAM missiles. So unfortunately, since it doesn't have a built-in radar of its own, you have to rely on the radar on the AMRAM to do so. So check this out. This is kind of interesting. Notice I have a pretty good range for a system like this. I have a range of about 16, 17 nautical miles. Go ahead, lock onto this guy over here. He'll fire a couple onto you. He'll fire a couple onto you. So unlike the Chaparro, which um, unfortunately you can only use your sidewinders, now you gain the capability to actually engage something that has a little bit of altitude because you are a radar-based system. Notice, however, that this guy cruising up at 32,000 feet is completely invincible again. Can't do anything about it. However, this chap, who's going to fly right across the nose, is going to be traveling nice and low, nice and fast. We're going to be looking right at him, pointing at it, and notice we are not able to fire yet because we don't have a high-quality radar track of it. 
So you can see, although it's a neat system, we can't do anything unless there's something to guide the missile for us. Now that's an interesting little problem. You know, you can't even do like a bearing only shot or anything like that, leaving our hum ram kind of all alone unless it has a supporting radar that it needs to actually fire. So again, unique systems. And I love how they basically took all the load out of an S16 and put them on a truck. <laughs> that's kind of a neat setup. All right, let's take a look at the THAAD. Now, all these systems so far were basically multi-purpose systems. I mean, some of them are anti-aircraft or helicopter. Some of them could be mixed. THAAD is a little unique, and I was really hoping they'd give us a neat little picture here of this thing. Basically, what THAAD is, is if you remember way back in the day, we had the Spartan. That's basically the modern version of the Spartan. It is an anti-ballistic missile system. It is basically the last ditch. It stands for a Terminal High Altitude Air Defense, in case anybody's curious. This system is weird. It basically is this giant battery of missiles all pointing at the sky with a very sophisticated radar on it. So in order to properly test this system, notice, by the way, we can't use this against airplanes, which is kind of a bummer because this would be fun. You'll notice it has a range of about 200 nautical miles and it has the ability to engage incoming ballistic missiles, or so they claim. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself some incoming ballistic missiles to test the theory. Let's go ahead and uh, aim right here. We'll go ahead and fire all four because I'm mean. Go ahead and switch sides. Go back to the SAM. Let's go get my friend Thad here. I'm actually going to set him to free fire mode. Active radar because I want him to go ahead and just go to town the way he feels. You know, I want him to feel natural with this particular engagement. Let me confirm that that worked correctly. Uh, free fire. Good. Okay. So we go ahead and unpause here. Notice it has a staggeringly long range radar view here. And again, it's got the same limitation as the Patriot. It only points in one direction. Hey, trade-offs. So these missiles are now launched. Notice we caught them uh, at an altitude of, let's see here, what do we got? 102 kilometers. Speed up time a little bit here as we watch the transition. Remember, that is terminal high altitude air defense. It is not going to be a system dedicated for the purposes of engaging stuff that's far away. That's going to be Aegis as well as uh, some of the later systems. All right, now it seems to have uh, slowed down our little simulation here. That happens sometimes. Speed up time a little bit here. It does not like that. There we go. Missiles away. All right, let's watch this little Thad do its thing here. Go Thad. Notice, by the way, that this system has the capability to engage multiple targets simultaneously. So if you actually look here, look at how many missiles it just fired. And each one of those is independently targeted, independently reentry. And they're all kind of a neat system in the fact that, um, look at this. <laughs> There's nothing quite like watching one of these. There's actually a really neat video online where you can see one of the performances of these weapons as it basically shoots into space. Now, the current speed on this is a Mach, just about Mach 8, so it's a tremendously high-speed weapon. And remember, this is the last ditch. We're going to get killed anyway. We might as well shoot a missile at it and cross our fingers kind of situation. All right, so it's now going to go ahead and arc out, and it's actually diving to engage the incoming warheads, which is actually a really bad idea from my perspective. Because uh, you can see them all going. See what I mean? What you do, whoop, kind of a thing like that. Here comes our vampires. Here comes our vampires. Will it succeed? And splish, 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 splish. Now, the neat thing about Thad, by the way, is it has the ability to retarget. So if it kills something, it can actually pick a new target and keep going. So that's Thad. That's, again, kind of last-ditch air defense system. Again, not air defense, ballistic missile defense. Let's go ahead and take a look at Aegis Ashore. Now, Aegis Ashore is a, kind of the middle ground between, uh, I need something that's kind of like Thad, but I need something with a little bit more reach. So if you remember, Thad had about a 200 nautical mile range. Aegis Ashore, on the flip side, has this amount of range. That is a 1,300 mile range for this missile. By the way, it is a very large missile, in case you couldn't figure that out. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and uh, switch back to the other side, get myself my handy dandy target, and we're gonna go ahead and fire a couple of things right over here. Again, I'm a mean guy, so I'm gonna launch all four. Let's go ahead and get my handy dandy Aegis Ashore here. I'm gonna let it do all the work for me. Uh, we'll go to Doctrine Window, go ahead and turn it on. Nuclear Weapons, sure, let's do that, that seems safe. All right, notice the range of the radar here is fairly limited. However, remember the fact this can be guided by the radar systems, which is why I've got this one here. But anyway, let's go ahead and speed up time a little bit here. Remember, we fired a moment ago, and we've already acquired them. Aegis is now going ahead and not fired before it entered into its own radar range. You're sitting there going, wait, what? So I had this thing called the SBX-1, which is a sea-based radar. It can actually co-guide these weapons. So all right, let's watch what happens here. So we're going to go ahead and launch. I'm going to get a little tiny bit of lag here when this thing does its initial climb out. The anti-ballistic missile calculations, for whatever reason, always slow things down. Because remember, you're predicting something on a parabola. You're not predicting something in a straight line anymore. But this thing is basically climbing up into space. <laughs> 
relatively low so far. It picks up a bunch of speed. We're now traveling almost Mach 10 with this weapon, and there it goes. Now, it's fun, because if I set this to real time, can you see how fast this is traveling? We're at Mach 14 now. All right, so the Aegis is going to keep climbing. Wouldn't it be nice to use this against the airplanes? All right, here comes our intercepts. Go ahead and zoom in a little tiny bit here. You can see they're constantly getting mid-course upgrades and updates, and let the fireworks begin. Mission accomplished. Nicely done, Aegis. Nicely done. Which brings us to our final system we're going to be taking a look at on the Americans today, and that is going to be GMD. Again, this is not an anti-aircraft system. This is an anti-ballistic missile system. The GMD stands for ground-based uh, mid-course destruction. Basically, this was a missile for the purposes of destroying a missile as it climbs from the ground. It requires unique radar. That's the SBX-1. Without this radar, you can't actually launch this weapon. If you actually look at this weapon on its own, you'll notice it doesn't possess its own sensors on board. So let's go ahead and recreate our last little situation real quickly here. Grab this one. We're going to go ahead and lock on to the GBI. Fire everybody at it. Go back to Sam. I'm going to go to my GMD. I'm just going to let him go ahead. Uh, defense, not destruction. I'm sorry. All right. going to go ahead and flip this on. I'm going to go ahead and tell it. Remember, there's no radar anyway. I'm going to tell it to do free fire. I'm not actually going to give it any instructions. By the way, look at the range of this weapon. <laughs> uh, 2,800 nautical miles. <laughs> what you don't realize is, if you look at this picture right here, this is a silo this thing came out of. This is like basically a little Minuteman missile, but for the purposes of engaging other missiles. So you can imagine what that's like. All right, speed up time a little bit. Do, 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 oh, we've already detected, and GMD is already fired. So now this is kind of interesting. Let me go ahead and show you this from the side real quick so you can get a feel for the uh, scale we're working at here. So here's our handy-dandy ballistic missiles. They're just starting to climb up. They're doing the little thing. And these are theater missiles, so they're kind of just cruising on up, uh, kind of making pretty good time. They're about 119 kilometers up already. Meanwhile, GMD is a... <laughs> look at this nasty-looking thing. Uh, that reminds me of something. Um, of course, uh, we can see this thing climbing up pretty aggressively. It is almost to Mach 20 here. It is at an altitude of, let's see here, 50,000 feet. If I zoom out a little bit, you can actually watch the two systems basically race for each other here. Let me go ahead and uh, speed up time a little bit. Uh, looks good, looks good. Again, it's constantly getting updates from that sea-based radar. This is a buddy lazing kind of system. And you can watch them. They're literally climbing into space in order to engage this particular projectile. We're 110 kilometers. We're as high as Mercury right now. And this thing is still going. Still going. Oop, that's got a bit of an arc to it. That makes me a little nervous. Survey says it's going to be close. Now, remember, this is actually a staged weapon. We don't get to see the individual stages. Oh, boy, look at that arc. Oh, I think it's going to miss. Ah, swing and a miss. So, unfortunately for us, our uh, GMD here didn't do a terribly good job of it. It was, unfortunately, it launched basically at the wrong time and it launched a little too soon. I'm going to go ahead and order this one up to free fire because I'm a nice guy. He's already set to free fire. Let's go get Thad. We don't want anybody accidentally right now, so we'll go ahead and order him to go ahead and fire too. Again, we don't want to do any damage to our little range in, you know, eastern Texas. All right, we're going to give them a second to go ahead and target, and everybody should be basically having a free-for-all at that target in a second here. All right, getting a little closer, a little closer. They're still guiding the missiles. Uh-oh. We don't seem to be guiding. Fire. Hmm, <laughs> there it goes. Thad gets his missiles off first. There he goes. Oh, boy. Nah, it's not going to go well for that missile. Splat. <laughs> All right. So hopefully this was helpful. Again, I was just trying to show off some of the capabilities of American SAMs. As you can see, there's a little less variety. But the key element is almost every American system is going to be a little bit more general. And, you know, we're going to sacrifice range so we have plenty of altitude. Or we're going to have an amazing system, but we're only going to be able to point it in one direction. That's a general common trend. The other thing for the low altitude stuff is you don't have anything like a rapier in American inventory. You, know, you don't have that super short range, basically, surprise, missile. Or like the SA-8 over on the Soviet side of things. You know, you basically, you know, you've got the Sidewinder and you've got the Hum Ram, which is always kind of fun to get it to work. All right, hopefully this video has been helpful as far as demonstrating that. Uh, we'll probably take a look at some European systems next because uh, they're unique as well. And again, it's all about meeting the needs of that particular country's armed forces. Enjoy.